We were created for love. We can feel it with every fiber of our being. But all too often our search for love leaves us feeling alone with a more intense awareness of our need for real love. Our efforts leave us damaged and our wake filled with the wrecked remains of too many family members. It's time to experience true love. It's time to experience the Father's embrace. I heard Brennan Manning say recently, he said, all of us need a, a sign that we have in the front door of our house that soon as people walk into our home there's this great big sign there that says don't you come in here and should on me <laughs> s-h-o-u-l-d because we learned last night that it's all the things we should do that keep us with an unhealthy fear of coming into god's presence and we learned last night that God wants us to be at home in Him. But if we have an unhealthy fear of God, we can't come into that place. And I've come to realize as we ministered in the last two years, we've ministered to pastors and leaders, missionaries from over a hundred nations. And it doesn't make any difference whether it's Canada or the U.S. or Europe or Asia or Africa. The problem's the same. Very few people can find this place of intimacy. They've tried praying an hour of day. They've tried the Word. They've tried doing all the right religious things. Many have tried carpet time, but they can't come into this place to where they finally... <laughs> Ed's in the right place today. They're finally at home in love. And see, I've learned most people need a new God. I was in Tibet a, a couple of years back doing work with missionaries there and training them in the Father's love. And we came to in the Lhasa, the most holy temple of all Tibetan Buddhism. And everyone in a lifetime has to make a journey there. And for, for miles and miles, they crawl on their hands and knees to this temple. And they go inside this temple. And, and they've got their children. And their children are screaming and screaming. And there's, there's, there's a, a hundred idols in there. And they must do do bow down to everyone and make a sacrifice and everyone is 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 full of fear and terror every face of the idols and the children are just so terrified and they leave there filled with the religion of fear and i was there and i thought man these people need a new god but then as i began to minister to the 40 missionaries that gathered from around tibet it was only a few hours later as I began to talk to them the Father's love and began to counsel in their marriages, and I realized these missionaries need a new God because the God they have is producing every bit as much fear as those within these demonic temples and these idols that they are so overwhelmed by a fear of failure, a fear of rejection, a fear of intimacy, they need a new God. And if you're still battling with fears, you're still battling with inferiorities, you're still battling with insecurities, and your God hasn't set you free from them, you need a new God today. Because God's promised us in 1 John 4, 18, His love, His perfect love will cast out all fear. And maybe it's not a new God you need, but maybe it's a new image of God you need. Because odds are, if you come to a Jack Frost meeting, the odds are you're battling oppression every day of your life. If you've got it all together, you wouldn't be here. Because it's only hurting people that usually come to these type of meetings to where they're so assaulted with having to deal with their core pain. And most of us in this room are daily battling oppression and it really all comes down to the little fact that you really don't know how valuable you are to God. You don't know how loved you are. And when you don't know how valuable you are, you don't know how accepted, you don't know how loved you are, then every day you battle fear. 
and anxiety, and you don't feel you have a safe place. You don't feel close to the Father's house. A couple of years ago, I was on a ministry trip, and it's an interesting thing. I found when the, men, when the Father is out of the house, and I travel every other week for about five, six, seven days, when the Father's out of the house, the children test every boundary that we have. And my children now are 23 and 20, and my youngest is 15, and my oldest just moved, moved out for the third or fourth or fifth, something like that. But we've got a little Chinese pug bulldog. I mean, just a little Chinese. And, and he's only allowed in the living room and in the kitchen and the laundry room. And he runs up to the door and to the threshold of the door, and he sticks his head through down the hallway, wanting where everybody's at, and he won't let his feet cross the line as long as the father's in the house. <laughs> but as soon as I pack my bags, and he learns, he sees the bags go out the door. And as soon as my suitcase goes out the door, he waits till the door is closed. And when it closes behind me, he goes running in all the bedrooms and jumps on every bed of the house. <laughs> and my children are just like that. You see, if you have a sense of the closeness of the Father, it's a restraint within your life from stepping into dangerous territory where there's a giant that's going to come at you with a wad of paper in his hand and tear you up as I run Teddy out of the bedrooms. Sometimes I go out, close the door, and just come back in to catch him in the bedroom. It's the power of the Father's presence. And a couple of summers back, I was out of town, and my daughter was 17. She was having a bad hair week. <laughs> and those of you all in TAC have gotten to know my daughter, you know when my daughter's having a bad hair week, she's going to make sure you have it with her. <laughs> she's not going to be there alone. And she was just terrorizing her older brother and a younger brother and my, my wife. And my wife calls on the phone about four days in the trip. If you don't hurry up and get home, you're not going to have a daughter when you get home. I've had about enough of this. I want you to talk to her right on the phone and get her on the phone right now. And I said, no, 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 because when I handle things without first taking time, Father, how would you deal with this? I hurt people. I hurt people quickly. And I said, just let me wait. Let's let me wait. I'll get home. And, and well, you better hurry up and get home. And I was a couple hours drive from home, and I headed home up on Thursday and the whole way there, Father. I have did enough damage in the first 14 years. I could probably multiply it two or threefold in just five minutes' time when I get home. Help me, Father. How would you deal with this? How would you deal with it? And so I come in the house and feel like I got a word from the Lord, and I come in the house, and, and my, daughter, my daughter's there. I mean, shoulders bowed. She's waiting on the hammer to come down. Now, when you know you have failed... When you know you have deserved judgment, what is your image of the Father? <laughs> oh, holy God, oh, sinful me. Or, because your image of the Father is going to determine the amount of intimacy you have. And your image of the Father is going to determine how comfortable you are with love. And this time I just put it off and I just... Asked her how her time went and shared with her. Went in unpacking and we just laughing, carrying on. And Sarah says, Dad, would you go to the pool with me? And she's still kind of hesitant. She's waiting on the, on the punishment. And I said, yeah, let's go to the pool. We went over the pool around the corner and, and played and laughed and wrestled and had a great time. And we came back into the house and... My wife was home by then. She'd been out shopping with the boys, and they're in the house, and Sarah runs in to take a shower, and down the hall, we'd never heard our, our daughter sing in the shower. I hope you in school of ministry hadn't heard her either. <laughs> because down the hall comes this song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, <laughs> and I'm so happy, so very happy. And my wife looks at me and says, can you believe what the presence of the Father does in the house? Five days she's made everybody's life miserable. Now look at the joy she's walking in. Tell me, when you failed and you deserve judgment, 
What does the presence of the Father mean to you? Because if the presence of the Father means to you, oh, holy God, oh, sinful me, that's how you will treat others when they disappoint or fail you. And intimacy is impossible. And see, God's created us in His image. He's created us for love. He's created us by love. He's created us to love. And He sent us to our families and the nations with His love. But most of us aren't comfortable with that. And see, we've been through a season of visitation where we've cried out, more, Lord, more, Lord, and we've cried out from visitations from God. Well, God doesn't want to visit you. Visitors are great. My home is filled with visitors from all over the world. You never know what country they're going to be from. We love company. We can't wait till visitors come. We can't wait till visitors leave. You know how that is? And see, I, I had a health crisis about 11 years ago, and out of, out of that and much of the healing process was, was nutrition, and I went into a whole vegetarian lifestyle. And, and because of that, I have to eat a lot of beans, and there's just something about 15 bean soup. I mean, and visitors are coming over. And my wife sees me get the crock pot out, you know, the slow cooker out, and putting that, and she says, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know who's coming to the house tonight? You're not going to put that on, are you? And the boys are going, all right, Dad, let's go for it, you know? Because teenage boys, you know, and, and young, I mean, they can't wait to have a good war. There's nothing like a good war in the house. <laughs> and they don't care if visitors are coming over. They think it's funny, you know? <laughs> and they're really going get to get the sister. Let's see what we can do to get the sister. And visitors are coming in the house. You're just not at rest when visitors are in the house. You're not comfortable. You don't let yourself, your hair down. You're artificial. You're not real. And see, God's not looking for a visitation. He's looking for an inhabitation. He's wanting to come and dwell in your house even the days that the bean soup goes on the table. Because He loves you the way you are, not the way you smell. <laughs> He'll show you a whole lot more grace than my wife will, please. <laughs> please, not in the fabric, in the sofa. People are coming over tomorrow, you know. <laughs> and see, God Himself will not rest until you rest in Him. The God who's completely complete in Himself makes a statement in Isaiah 66, 1. He, he said, where is there a house that I might build? Where is there a home I might rest? He will not cease from his labors until he finds rest in you. And as long as you're so concerned about the things in your life that just don't smell too good sometimes around the house and cause you to feel that, no, 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 we can't do that when visitors in the house. As long as you're so concerned about that, you'll not find rest in God. Yet He's created you for that place. I love John 1, 18. It says, Jesus proceeded forth from the bosom of the Father. Now think about that. Where did He come from? I mean, here's where Jesus came from. He came from the bosom of the Father. In John 8, 14, it, it's, it hints that He went back from the place He came. Now He came from the bosom of the Father. He went back from the place He came. And in John 8, 14, 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as an orphan, but I will come to you. In verse 21, He says, I will disclose myself. That word disclose. I'll make known my love to one or more of your five senses in Greek. And then verse 23, then my Father and I will make our home in you. You see, Father's looking for a home. But if you're concerned that everything's not right, you know how it gets when visitors are coming to the house? I mean, the man's life is miserable, and the woman just tortures the kids that everything has got to be perfect, everything in its place. You just can't rest. With visitors, you can only rest with family, with people that dwell with you with people that live with you. But if your image of God is the angry God, how can you find rest in Him? Yet religion has portrayed a God that is angry, 
that's making his list and checking it twice and he's out to get you. Now, I went to holiness Bible school. I was a holiness pastor, and I mean old line holiness. I could preach more people out of heaven than I could preach into heaven. And see, in holiness Bible school, they taught us of an angry God, an angry God that was out to get us, and not for Jesus protecting us from this angry God. And this angry God was, was all I knew. And now, if you came into the church today, and you saw somebody was angry with you sitting right over here, odds are you avoided them and you sat over there. You, you can't have intimacy with someone who's angry at you. Now, a couple of you sat right next to that, not right next to that person, it was your wife. But, <laughs> but see, you can't have intimacy with someone who's mad and angry at you, yet religion has told us of an angry God. And it's misrepresented who Jesus is. And see, Jesus died so that we might have intimacy with the Father. He came, He gave His life so we might be restored to the Father's love. When my daughter first got her learner's driver's permit when she was 15, I was so thankful I was out of town because her first experience behind the wheel of a car fell to my mother, to my wife. Oh, don't ever tell my wife I compared her to my mother. <clears throat> My life will end. <clears throat> but my wife took her for a first driving lesson, and they went around this place to where we kind of call it Dead Man's Curve because it's real swampy on both sides, and, and, and it's a narrow road around a blind curve, and the teenagers get out of school and go flying around that curve about 50 miles an hour, and, and many cars get run off the side of the road. And my daughter went that way the first time, and it was bound to happen. As soon as they get around the car, here comes the curve, here comes a teenager flying around the curve, runs her off the road, and there's about three foot before you go down and roll down in about an eight foot ditch down into the water. And she's right over the three foot part, and the car's leaning about to go down, and my wife is calmly saying, would you get the car back on the road? Would you get it? If you saw the movie Hook, remember, remember Peter Pan had grown up and he'd become an adult. And he'd forgotten that he was ever Peter Pan. And Captain Hook comes back, and he wants, to, he wants to get revenge on Peter Pan. So he steals his son and daughter, takes them back to Never Never Land, and, and Tinkerbell has to come, and, and of course Robin Williams is Peter Pan, and, and get him back to, to, to Never Never Land. And he doesn't believe he's Peter Pan. He can't remember that. He'd lost his childlikeness. And when you lose your childlikeness, you lose your happy thought. And you can't fly anymore. And the only way he was going to be able to overcome Captain Hook was he had to remember his, off, his happy thoughts so he could fly. And at the moment of crisis, when Sarah is about to roll over in the ditch, in the moment of failure once more, when mom's responding out of fear and causing her to feel ashamed, what's Sarah's first thought? Let me think my happy thought. Let me think my happy thought. Tell me, when the world's pressing in on you, when the people at work are making you feel like a total failure, when friends at church, when spouse, when parents or children are causing you to feel nothing but shame, what is your happy thought? For 44 years, half gallon of mint chocolate chip ice cream. <laughs> Have you noticed how good ice cream tastes when everything's going wrong? <laughs> and for a number of years, <laughs> for 15 years, nothing like pornography to give you a good happy thought, huh, guys? You see, because if your happy thought isn't how much God loves you, during these times of crisis, you'll look for comfort in all the wrong places. And finally, they didn't roll off in the ditch. They got back out on the, the road. They went around the curve, came up to this church, and my wife said, pull the car into the parking lot there. And they pulled it over in the parking lot, and she said, driver's wrestling over. We'll wait until your daddy gets home. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and as they're driving back to the house, my wife just very calmly says, by the way, what was your happy thought? She says, daddy, daddy. 
my daddy wouldn't have got upset with me. <laughs> got her fooled. Uh, and <laughs> that only lasted till I got home. I didn't have her fooled anymore after that. <laughs> and now I've got a 15-year-old boy, and we're going through his driving lessons. And oh, my goodness, pray for me. <laughs> but tell me, when you feel like you've let everybody down, when you feel like you've fallen short in your Christian walk, what is your image of God? Oh, holy God, oh, sinful me. Or do you realize he's got his arms outstretched ready until you restore you to his love? Because you will either live your life as if you have a home, Henry Nouwen, or you'll live your life as if you don't have a home. You either live your life that when everything goes wrong, you've got a safe place to run to and to find rest in the Father's love. Or you live your life as if you do not have a safe place, and we call that the spiritual orphan. And there's a three-tape series in there on the spiritual orphans and the resource center. And it all comes down to what our image of the Father is when we failed. And see, most people are uncomfortable with the Father's love. They're uncomfortable with intimacy with God because of two reasons. And we saw the first reason last night was a misrepresentation of the Father's love by our parental or earthly fathers. And it leaves us looking at the Heavenly Father through the lens of the relationship we had with our earthly fathers or our stepfathers. And the second reason is we've developed a false understanding of who Father God is basically because of religion that is based on performance or fear. And it leaves us needing a new God. Because religion that's based on performance or fear creates hidden lies with inside of us, lies that, that bring us a misunderstanding of who God is, lies that say we must perform a certain way to earn deeper levels of God's love, Religion that plays, downplays the importance of feelings and emotions, and love is a feeling and emotion. And see, and we addressed to some degree that issue also last night, how it leaves us like the young man that had all of these things stacked on side of him, trying to do all these things right so, so he could earn love and acceptance in God, but it only left him so weighed down he had no energy left to love his family. And so we've seen the representation of fathers. We've seen the misrepresentation of religion. Now, let's lay down our past image of God, and let's see what Jesus said about his father. Let's turn to John 14. John 14. <clears throat> and as we're turning to this, we need to know the context of, of what Jesus was saying. It's his last few hours with the disciples. And if you only had a few hours of life left and you knew it, you would make this the most meaningful conversation in all of your relationships. And he gathered his disciples together in the Last Supper, and he begins to have this conversation with them. And right after he had washed their feet in John 13, he now begins to tell them that it's the night and hour of his betrayal. This is not good news. Only a few days earlier in Matthew 20, verse 18 and 19, he tells them, now we're going to Jerusalem, the chief priest and the scribes will condemn me to death. He tells them they're going to deliver me over to the Romans, to the Gentiles. I will be mocked. I will be scourged. And then I'll be crucified. And now, John 13, he's telling them the hour's here, the hour's come. Now, these guys weren't rejoicing. Because I believe that these guys believed, really felt, the disciples felt that Jesus was going to come and he was going to establish an earthly kingdom, some great event would occur, the Romans would be overthrown, Jesus would be set on the throne of the world and on Jerusalem, the disciples would be sitting at his right and his left hand, and now he's telling them, I'm going to be crucified and die. 
total panic hits them, fear, anxiety. At three and a half years, they've walked with this guy, and now he's saying he's going to leave, and he's going to be crucified when he leaves. He's going to be betrayed. And of course, in Roman times, when the leader of a sect was captured, and he was tortured, and he was crucified, they also got the whole sect and all their families and tortured and killed all of them. And now he's saying, it's my hour to die, and they're beginning to think, we're going to die with you. It was not a good moment in the three and a half years that they'd spent with him. And now this is the context of John 14. Total fear and anxiety and disappointment hit them. And in John 14, Jesus tells them, let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's home, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Now catch that. Where did Jesus come from? Hmm? John 1, 18, the bosom of the Father. John 8, 14, went back from the place he came. Came from the bosom of the Father, went back from the place he came. Disciples filled with fear and anxiety. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus came from the bosom of the Father. He went back from where he came. In their time of fear and crisis, where can they go? <laughs> You're going to have a safe place when the world's pressing in on you, when your family's coming against you. When your workplace is coming against you, there's going to be a place you can go where you'll have no fear. He goes on and says, and you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, I've been taught this in Bible school as the first verse we had to memorize for evangelism. It's not an evangelism verse. That's out of context. It's a verse about during a time of anxiety, during a time of fear, during a time of oppression in your life, during a time when everything's going wrong in your life. There's a way to the Father to where you don't have to have fear to where His perfect love will cast out all fear. There's a way to the Father. It was a verse all about intimacy. And a way has no meaning if it does not have a destination. Queen Elizabeth Way has no meaning if it doesn't get you to Niagara Falls. There has to be a final destination, and Jesus is the way. But the Father's the final destination. And I'm taking nothing away from who Jesus is, that his finished work on the cross gets us to the Father, but let's see where Jesus is trying to lead us to in the hour of crisis. If you would have known me, you would have known my Father also. Wait a minute. If you'd known me, you'd have known my Father also. The end of verse 9. He who has seen me has seen my Father. Now, the theology I learned in Bible school was angry Father. And because of our sin, His judgment is coming to us. We're going to be burned. We're going to be cast in the pit of fire. He's out to get you. He's out to destroy you. Loving Jesus, protecting you from an angry father. Now, that's the theology I knew for 15 years. How many, how many others heard that theology? Angry God being protected by loving Jesus. But Jesus just said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you'd have known me, you would have known the Father. Hebrews 1.3. Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of God. Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. How can Father be this guy and Jesus be this guy? Huh? Is that not what many of us were taught in religious circles? Angry Father, loving Jesus. Hebrews 1.3, one more. Repeat it again. Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of God. Many of you got pencils out. I want you to start a page, all of itself, and put on there the nature of the Father. 
the nature of the Father. Now, one time Jesus described his nature. He talked about the nature of the Holy Spirit. He talked about who his Father was. He would describe himself, yes, I'm the salt of the earth, but in Matthew 11, 29, he says this, I am meek and lowly of heart. And so we see meek and lowly loving Jesus, and we see angry Father. Somewhere an ungodly belief has been built within us because Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so if Jesus was meek and lowly, and he was the exact representation of the nature of God, he's the image of the invisible God, then you've got to put under the nature of the Father. The Father is what? Meek and lowly. Put it down. Father God has a meek and lowly heart. Or you may have another version that says he is of a humble and gentle spirit. So you can put down there, Father is of a humble and gentle spirit. Because how can any of you have intimacy with this guy? I grew up with this guy. I didn't have intimacy with him until I was 38 years old and led him to the Lord. But one thing I did, I did everything that I could do to keep the punishment and pain off the door for many years. But see, easy to have intimacy with Jesus. But look at verse 8. This guy Philip always amazed me. Because look at his words. He says, Jesus, show us the Father and it'll be enough. What is the matter with this guy? Now, if that was you, and for three and a half years you had been walking with Jesus, and you saw Jesus walk on water, would that be enough for you? Maybe Jesus raising the dead, would that be enough for you? Maybe Jesus healing the lepers, would that be enough for you? Healing the blind, the deaf hearing, the lame walking, and a hundred books can't contain all the miracles that Jesus did. And you were there for all of them, and you saw this. You saw him just speak the word, be still, in the storm, in the sea, just suddenly. That would have been enough for me. I was a sailor. Yep, you're the man. You're the man. <laughs> I tried that thousands of times. It never worked for me. But if it works for Jesus, that's enough. But Philip says, it's been great being with you, Jesus. Man, I've enjoyed these three and a half years, and you know, but it's really not enough hanging around you. Because really, I've spent all this time with you because I'm really looking for your dad. And even though you've done all these wonderful miracles and signs and wonders, show me the Father and I'll finally be content. That's what it says in the message. Show me the Father and I'll finally be content. And see, the church has camped out upon Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we've not been Trinitarians. We've been dualists, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. But I don't want to get too close to this guy. I don't blame you. And we've left the Father out of our relationship. And see, Jesus died so that you could be restored and for the Father's love. And for you to live in fear, an unhealthy fear of God, is to fall short of what Jesus died for, to bring you into a deep relation, almost sat on the lady's lap, <laughs> and a deep loving relationship with the Father. Jesus was the man he was because of the Father he had. He wasn't the man he was because he was the Son of God. He wasn't the man he was because he was God, I should say. He was the man he was because of the Father he had. And you are the man or the woman you are because of the Father you have. Which one do you have? <sighs> then who do your children see you as? <sighs> or you're the man or the woman you are because of the Father you have. <sighs> and then who do the children see you as? See, intimacy with God and intimacy with your family all begins by your image of God. 
And if your God has left you with fears and insecurity and uncomfortable with love and a fear of receiving love and a fear of giving love, you need a new God. You need the one that Jesus represented. And let's go on to verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative. Oh, catch that phrase. Jesus' own words. The words that I speak, I do not speak on my own initiative. The end of verse 24. The word which you hear is not mine, but the words the Father gave me. Angry Father, loving Jesus, listen to Jesus' words. Where did they come from? Before Jesus spoke anything, where did he get the word from? Father. John 5, 19. Truly, truly, Jesus says, the Son can do nothing he has not seen the Father do, and whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. John 8, 28. He's doing, I'm doing the deeds. <clears throat> Let me get to that. Or John 828, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father taught me. Verse 38, I speak the things I've seen with my Father. So before Jesus could give one teaching or speak a word, who first spoke it? Father did. Before Jesus could do a miracle, verse 10, the Father abiding in me does his works. The miracles that Jesus did, where do they come from? The Son can only do what He's seen the Father do. Whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. And yet we see an angry Father, tender, loving Jesus. Somewhere we've believed a lie. Because every miracle Jesus did, who did it first? Father, according to Jesus' own words. Every word Jesus spoke, who spoke it first? Father according to Jesus' own words. Now, let's look at a couple of things he did. One of the things Jesus did was he fed the, fed the multitudes. And we see all the thousands of people gathering around Jesus, and we see him coming up onto the mountain and being so concerned with their need because Jesus was more concerned with need than law. He was motivated by need, not rules, not laws, not discipline. And he sees the need within the people that they're, they're hungry, and he begins to take a few loaves, a few fishes, and he feeds the thousands that are present. Now tell me, was there Gentiles that followed Jesus? Yeah. Was there probably immoral people, adulterers that followed Jesus? We know that. Was there thieves that followed Jesus? We know that. Tax collectors. Did these people deserve anything from God based upon their own works? But Jesus met all of their need. Did he single out the righteous from the unrighteous? No, he said, I came for the unrighteous. He said, the righteous don't need a doctor. They're well. They're doing quite fine. I came for those that are needy. And he fed every one of them. Now, keep in mind, he only did what he's seen his father do. Jesus said, my father reigns on the unrighteous as much as he reigns on the righteous. But see, we've gone through, and I've gone through, a whole philosophy and religion that if I get my prayer life down, I get my life in the Word down, I get my giving down, I get everything in place, and I'm fasting, then God will bless me. And somehow, very subtly, we picked up a philosophy that I've got to get everything in order for the blessings of God to come to my life. And then we have more faith in us getting everything in order or our inability to do it than faith in a Father who wants to bless us the way we are, not the way we should be. I'm out on the golf course with my son, and he'd been in rebellion for me for five years. He'd left the house at 19, moved down 400 miles away to Florida where my father lived, and in the midst of all that rebellion, I'd go down and visit every now and then in my father and mother and every few months and I'm down and my dad loves to play golf and play golf every day and my son was like that and we we're out on the golf course and I could care less I just like to just be with people and go out there and I've learned if I care I get mad so don't care 
my dad takes out this nice new driver. He said, man, this guy gave it to me last week. It had a 350 US dollar price tag on it. See if you can hit it, son. And I hit that ball straighter and longer than I ever had. And he said, why don't you take it? I said, I will. After all, I deserved it. I've apologized to my father for the rebellion. I've led my dad to the Lord. We've restored our relationship. I'm a good son now, and because I'm a good son, I deserve everything my dad wants to give me, and I'm right there, take it, take it, take it, take it. And now we're out on a golf course shortly after that, and there's nothing my son likes better. He wants to be a golf pro, and he's an assistant golf pro. Nothing he likes better than beating me. Just something in the teenage sons that just want to whip their dad, you know? And I'm just killing him. I'm just destroying him. And he just can't, can't stand it because he plays golf every day. I play once a month. I don't care if I play or not. Somebody wants to go, fine. And I'm just destroying him. And he is just so angry. And I've got this brand new set of, of ping golf clubs my wife had saved up for years to get to me for Christmas. And I'd always had my dad's hand-me-downs, hand-me-downs. And, and I'm playing with this new set. And my son's playing with the set my dad wore out and handed down to me. And I double wore out and handed down to my son. And he's just whining, you know, it's because of these new clubs you got. If I had those clubs, I could be playing. And she just, and I had so much, I, I'd had enough of that, and I finally stopped the card on about the eighth hole, stopped, got out, and I took my golf clubs, and I gave them to him. I took his old ones, my old ones that I had, I took them back, and I said, there you go, son, they're yours. He goes, you've waited years, Dad. That's a thousand dollars, Dad. You waited years. You're giving them to me? Son, they're yours. I want you to have more than I've had. I want you blessed. And your life, as you want to be a golfer, if these will help you, then they're yours. And I went to get back in the cart, and I thought about that driver my dad just gave me, and I went back and I got that and took it back. But <laughs> but see, my desire to bless my son isn't based upon his five years of total rebellion and dishonor towards me. My desire is his dream, is to be a golf pro. And if anything I have, not based upon his behavior, if something will help meet his need, I live to meet his need that's not based upon his performance. And how much more can a father who's perfect love? If he lives to meet my need, because he's a loving father, we want to meet our need right where we're at. The blessing the father wants to pour upon us is to meet our needs, not based upon us getting our formulas in place, but he longs to give you what he has, not what you deserve. And I lived in poverty from the time I left the sea until I had this revelation of the Father because I had more faith in all the things that I've got to do before God to bless me than I had in a tender, loving Father who lives to supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory, not according to me praying enough, fasting enough, serving enough, treating my wife right, treating my kids right, winning souls, doing all the things I'm supposed to do. And see, for 15 years as a Christian, my faith was in doing all these things. And thus I wondered why I was never blessed. Today my faith is in this Father. And under the nature of the Father, you've got to put generosity under there. Generosity that's based upon His desire to bless you, not to give you what you deserve. Because when Jesus fed everyone that day, He didn't feed the ones that deserved it and leave the others out. He fed the ones even that didn't deserve it. God reigns on the unrighteous. Father gives golf clubs to the unrighteous just as much as my father gave the golf club to the righteous. You see? This is who father is. But religion's presented a formulas of having to get everything in place. Now let's go further. What about in John 8 when the Pharisees brought the adulterous woman to Jesus? 
And the law of Moses says that this woman is to be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? And he didn't respond too quick. You need to get a hold of that. Because when my wife asks me to discipline my children, I don't need to until I take a moment and say, Father, how would you do this? Because when I do it just like that, I hurt people. I do it the way my earthly father would. And so I have to take time. Now, Father, show me what you would do. And Jesus knelt down, rode in the dirt, and then he comes up. Oh, by the way, guys, he who's without sin here cast the first stone. And then he says to the woman, after they all left, he says, woman, where are thy accusers? And she says, I have none. He says, well, neither do I accuse you. Where did Jesus get those words from? Before Jesus ever spoke a word, he first heard his father speak it. And let's confirm that, John 5, 22. The father judges no one. <laughs> now, please, since 9-11, I've seen things on TV, and I've heard what people are saying about this is the judgment of God come down. I'm sorry, I'm, I struggle with that. That's like saying that you've got this five-year-old rebellious boy that just won't listen to you, and you happen to have a neighbor that raids fighting pit bulls and feeds them gunpowder just to make them a little bit more meaner, and this five-year-old just won't listen to you that day, so just to show him, just to teach him who's boss, you grab him by the nap of the neck, you take him over to the neighbor, and you throw him across the fence to the pit bulls. Now get what you deserve. Would any of you discipline your children like that? Oh, don't answer that. I know one or two might. <laughs> but see, when we say the judgment of God has come, certainly I can agree with he who the Father loves. He disciplines. But I can't agree with judgment. And there's verses of why, and if you need to look at those, turn with me to John 5.22. Look at the verses in John 5.22. Look at Jesus' own words. The Father, for not even the Father judges anyone, but He's given all judgment over to the Son. Now remember, as soon as you've failed, as soon as you've fall, fallen short in your Christian walk, as soon as you've misrepresented the Father's love to your family, what's the first thing we usually feel? <gasps> oh, holy God, oh, sinful me. Well, one or two of you, the rest of you always feel it's their fault. <laughs> The devil made me do it. No. You see, but even in the midst of our failure, the Father judges no one, but He's turned all judgment over to the Son. Verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words, believes him who sent me as eternal life, does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Now, in Holiness Bible School, they didn't have me put a magnet on my refrigerator door that said, said the Father judges no one. We had on there, get right or get left. <laughs> and we had on there, turn or burn. <laughs> that was on our sign out front. <laughs> but can you imagine driving by a holiness church, you know, and out there you see, the Father judges no one. Wow. Look at verse 13, John 17, or John 3, verse 17. John 3, 17. For God did not send... The Father did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world should be saved through Him. He who believes is what? He who believes in Jesus is what? He's not judged. He does not judge you when you fall short. He does not condemn you when you fall short. He does not accuse you when you fall short. That's someone else's job, the accuser of the brethren. Now look at John 12:47. Jesus' words again, if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, anybody relate in that category? I'm going to rain fire from heaven down and just smite you, just like we did. And hmm? No, that's what the disciples wanted him to do. But he says, if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, what? I do not judge you. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me, he who doesn't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, does not receive my sayings, has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him when? When? At the last day. 
as that day here. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, then comes judgment. But see, if your image of God is this when you fail, no intimacy. Instead, your image of God is this. And then your relationships are this. Guarded based upon others' performance. Because unconditional love is never based upon the merit of the one receiving it. Unconditional love is based upon the merit of the one giving it. And if your love is conditional because this is the God you have, then your love towards others is going to be based upon them doing everything right that meets your need. And when they're doing it all right, ah, oh, you hit the ball right now, son. I love you. Let's go to town, party. But as soon as you don't hit the ball right, what is the matter with you? Can't you do anything right? And Mark Verkler in his survey among Christians, 80% of Christians' thoughts are negative because we're all tied into accusatory, judgmental, negative thoughts because of we have a wrong image of God. We need a new God, one who's constantly reaching out constantly reaching out to restore us to his love. What about when Jesus calmed the sea? He just says, be still. I only do what I've seen my father do. Turn with me to John 16. John 16. <clears throat> In the context of John 16, we see right up front. How many, how many here have never been hurt by another Christian? <laughs> okay right place. Have you wondered how Christians can do and say some of the things they do and say? Have you, have you wondered how they can be so cruel and so mean and so persecuting? Your answer is right here in verse 2 and 3. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, and an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. Oh, we see that since 9-11. But how often the people that have heard us in church use religious language to say, to justify their rejection or their gossiping. <laughs> Why do they do these things? Verse 3, they do these things because they don't know the Father. Or me. Because if you don't know the Father, you don't have a proper image of even Jesus. And to have a right relationship with the bridegroom, you've got to have a right relationship first with the Father. You've got to have a right relationship with his love, with his tenderness, with his intimacy. In verse 23, in that day, in what day? In the day of trouble, in the day of persecution. This is all about pain that is going to come to your life. Anybody here can relate to that. In the day of the trouble, Jesus said, don't ask me any question. Don't come to me. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you shall ask the Father for anything, he'll give it to you in my name. Jesus says, come to the Father. In fact, Jesus said, when you're praying, say, our Father. But when crisis comes, what do we do in the church? Jesus. And please, I'm not taking anything away from Jesus. He's the way to the Father. His sacrifice on the cross cleanses us of our sins so we have free access and we can come before the throne of God boldly and cry out for grace and mercy in our time of need. Only through the shed blood of Jesus can we come there. But if you stop with Jesus, you fall short of receiving what Jesus died for. He said, when you're praying, come to the Father because we learned last night the greatest need in every one of us is to have a place in the Father's heart. But how many wants a place in this Father's heart? So we camp out with Jesus and never come to the place to where you can cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You can only do that in a loving, tender, gentle father. And see, when we saw Jesus say to the adulterous woman, I do not accuse you. You've got to put under the nature of the father. He is non-judgmental. You've got to be under the nature of the father. He'll never accuse or condemn me because he's turned it all over the sun. You've got to put under there, he loves me the way I am, the adulterous woman, not the way I should be. You've got to put under there, he loves me the way I am, 
not the way others tell me to be. See, this is the nature of the Father. But now we see Jesus saying, during the time of storms in your life, when everything is coming against you, Jesus comes up and be still. And now we see him saying, in the time of tribulation and crisis, come to the Father. When my youngest son is outside and the bully outside is beating him up, he doesn't come running into the house to his older brother saying, say, Michael, 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 help me with the bully outside, because usually the bully outside is his older brother beating him up. <laughs> he comes running to the Father, the Father, the Father, and Jesus is saying, in time of crisis, <laughs> I came forth from the bosom of the Father, I went back from the place I came, I'm gone to prepare a place for you, that in your time of crisis, where I am, you may be also. There you can cast all the cares for you because he careth your cares upon him because he careth for you. There you'll feel so loved and accepted in the Father that no matter what the people at work are saying about you, no matter what the people at church are saying about you, no matter what the people in your family are saying about you, if you're secured in the Father's love, it's just as water running off a duck's back because you know your acceptance is what the Father, what God says about you and thinks about you, not in what others say or think about you. And when others begin to unleash at you all their venom, they don't know the Father. They know this Father, and they're representing this Father to you. And tell me, do you feel more like a servant trying to appease a master? Or do you feel like a son completely at rest in a father's love? That determines the image of God you have. And Jesus goes on and says in verse 24, Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you receive that your joy may be made full. Yes, you come to the Father through the name of Jesus. These things I have spoken to you in a figurative language, but an hour is coming when I'll speak no more to you in a figurative language. I'll tell you plainly of the Father, and that hour is here. His last two hours, his last two hours with the disciples, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, he told them of the Father 51 times. I'm dying. I'm going to be with my Father. You need to know him. You need to know him. You need to know who he is. His first conversation, Jesus' first revelation of the Father, John 3, 16, my Father loves the world. My Father loves. My Father loves. My Father loves. And you've got to put under the nature of the Father. Loving. You've got to put under the nature of the Father. Forgave the adulterous woman. Forgiving. You've got to put under the nature of the Father. He'll calm the storm in my life. You've got to put it under the nature of the Father. He cares about every need. Everything you see in Jesus, He's the exact representation of the nature of the Father. The compassion you see in Jesus, you've got to put under there. He's compassionate. The empathy, able to discern the need in another, you've got to put under the nature of the Father. He empathizes with my hurt and pain. This is who Father is. You need a new image of God. He came to the lepers, and he touched the lepers. I only do what I've seen my Father do. Because he'd seen even the lepers unclean that have to walk down the street. No one is to come within 50 feet of them. They're not within, allowed within 50 feet of any other human being. And they walk down the street shouting out. It, by law, they have to do it. Unclean! Unclean! Think of the shame they carried. No one ever being able to touch them. Yet what did Jesus do? He violates the religious laws of the land in order to meet need. And the first thing he does is he touched the lepers, meeting the deepest need of their life for just an affectionate touch from someone that was clean. And then he heals them. I only do what I've seen my father do. He'd seen the prodigal. And the father run to them, the prodigal who was unclean and by Jewish law had to go through seven days ritualistic cleansing before he could even be welcomed home back into the house. And yet Father runs, leaves the house, runs to him, and embraces him. In Hebrews 2.11, Jesus is not ashamed to be called your God. Hebrews 11.16, or Jesus is not, Hebrews 2.11, Jesus is not ashamed to be called your brother. Hebrews 11.16, God is not ashamed to be called your God. 
He's not ashamed of what you've done. He's not ashamed of where you've been. No one here is too unclean to be touched. No matter how much you've hurt others, no matter how much you've failed, no matter how much you've sinned against God, how much you've sinned against yourself, how much you've sinned against others, Father's running to you with arms outstretched, ready to restore you to his love. Is this your image of God? Do you realize how easy intimacy with God is when I know no matter how much I fall short today, He's always right there. Luke 15, 31, my child, I am always with you, and all that I have is yours. Always, Dad? What's always mean? Always. Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave nor forsake you. I'll never desert nor forsake you. But see, if our image of God is this guy, as soon as it stinks around our house, he goes into a different room. Mm -hmm. But see, if our image of God is this thing, when it begins to stink around the house, he stays right home. He stays right home. He never leaves nor forsakes you. Now, let's go a little bit further, and I'm going to read some quick verses as we're winding down. John 14, 28, I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now get that in your thoughts. Jesus goes to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. One version said, there's one in heaven greater than I. Get to that thought. Jesus' words, there's one in heaven greater than I. Now Matthew 18, 4, whoever humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Oh, catch this. There's one in heaven greater than I. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. There's one in heaven greater than I. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28. Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. He only does what he's seen the Father do. Whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. The greatest in heaven will be servant of all. Are you getting this? Under the nature of the Father. He's a servant father. Because if Jesus took on the form of a servant, and he's the image of the invisible God, then Father is what? Is a servant. What else did he say? Matthew 18, 4, he said, unless we become as a little child. Now, John 13, 1, New International Version, it says this. Having loved his own, he now expressed the full extent of his love to his disciples. We're putting a problem here all together, building it up for the light to go off. There's one in heaven greater than I. The greatest will humble himself as a child. The greatest in heaven will be servant of all. Jesus now expressed the full extent of his love to his disciples. And what did he do in the next few verses? He took off his robes. He got out on his hands and knees, and he washed his disciples' feet. That act was an act reserved for the lowliest of slaves in a house, but not all houses had slaves, so it reserved for the youngest child within the house. And you'd come into a household, and it wasn't only to honor the guests that would come into the household, but the transportation system of the day kind of leaves, leaves a result of smog all around and affects us, our sinuses and kind of leaves us a little bit unclean throughout our breathing passages. Well, the transportation system of that day left things a little unclean too. You know, the donkeys and the camels walking through the streets and, and I mean, and tromping through that stuff. And it's, I mean, it's, and, and you know, on a slushy day, what it's like trying to get from your car into the house or office and not just leave some of the, 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 the ice and the muck and mud back up the calves of your legs. You can't hardly do it. You try as hard as you can. Now, can imagine them in those days, what the streets were like. And so you're going to go across town, a village, to visit your neighbor, you know? And I mean, you're trying as hard as you can, but by the time all the camels and donkeys have stepped in and it's everywhere, I mean, you, you just can't hardly get away from it, and now you come into the neighbor's house. <laughs> and so the first thing the, the master of the house does is sends his youngest son or youngest daughter or lowliest slave to come in 
and to greet you at the door to, to wash all the dung off of your feet and the dust. And it's an act of honoring you, but it's also an honor for his house. Let's leave it at the door. Now, what did Jesus do? Nobody came into the Last Supper and washed one another's feet. So Jesus comes and he, he kneels at the disciples and he now expresses the full extent of his love. And I saw that one day. Why? Why? Did the disciples walk with him three and a half years, lived with him, and he hadn't expressed the full extent of his love? What's so special about this moment? See, love, the fullness of love is expressed through service. Ed Cole's definition of lust, seeking to get your needs met is another expense, but the definition of love seeking to meet another's needs at your own expense. And now Jesus expressed the fullness of his love by seeking to cleanse and wash and take on the form of a servant. And I only do what I've seen my father do. The works that I do are not mine. They're works the father give me do. The son can't do anything of himself. He only does what he's seen the father do. And whatever the father does, the son does in like manner. Are you catching this? There's one in heaven greater than I. The greatest will be servant of all. The greatest will be as a little child. And when Jesus knelt down and washed the disciples' feet, it's given me faith. Don't build a theology on this, but I have the faith for it. That when I come into Father's house, when my life has come to an end and I come into Father's house, Abba's going to greet me at the door. And Abba's going to come in and say, Oh, Jack, my son in whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. Man, life has given you some hard punches. And have you noticed how you can forgive and you can let go of bitterness and you can do everything to walk free from those things that have hurt and wounded you, but it still just leaves you a little stain, doesn't it? And Father's going to greet me at the door, and he's going to son. And Father's going to kneel at my feet. And Jesus only did what he's seen his Father do, and Father's going to wash away all the cares of life. And in Revelations 21, it says he'll wipe every tear from your eye. And I thought one day, why was Jesus crying? Or why were we crying? When we get to heaven, man. <laughs> When I walk in those gates, I thought I was going to be rejoicing and dancing and screaming and hollering. No, 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 no. Because before that begins, Father will greet you at the door. And when this revelation began to come to me, I realized I've never expressed the full extent of my love to my children. Because as long as I tower over them, and I'm the master, the captain of my ship, of my house, you haven't fully loved someone until you're willing to meet another's needs at your expense. And I sat down with my children and I washed all of my children's feet and they wept and wept and wept as I washed all the stains of the dung that I'd afflicted upon them from the years I wasn't comfortable with love. And I kissed the tears from my daughter's cheeks and I wiped the tears from my son's eyes. And I realized, this is the servant father. He's not the cop in the sky. But he's a father ready to lay down his life and humble yourself because the greatest in heaven will be servant of all. One day soon, it's going to be the great wedding supper of the Lamb. Have you ever wondered who will serve it? Not you. You're the bride in all your glory and all your radiance, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now the greatest in heaven will be servant of all. And yet most of us have felt more like servants and slaves in Father's house than sons and daughters because we've not realized the nature of the Father. 
before I came into this revelation. My daughter was in such rebellion into me at 14 years old, and I took her to the roller skate rink one Saturday, and she didn't want to be seen with me. All her other friends just drop their children off, or parents just drop their children off and leave them. And I said, I'm not dropping off a 14-year-old surfer girl in an 18-year-old body. No, there's just no way I'm coming in. Well, just, I don't want to be seen with you. It'll be embarrassing. So I drop her off, and I drive around the block, and I come back. And I go in, and I grew up at skate rinks and on roller skates, and I go in, and I, I get my skates on, and I'm skating around, and, and that skate rink was a dark corner, and I pretended like I didn't know my daughter, so I went over in the dark corner where, where the couples would go to make out and stuff, you know, but I went over there to play I Spy with my daughter, and, and then the lights went down low, and the DJ said, it's couple skate only, couple skate only. Everybody clear the floor. And so the couple started lining up on the floor. And I'm watching my daughter as one guy comes in and he gets rejected. And another guy comes in and asks her to skate and he gets rejected. And then she starts heading over. She's looking all around. And I'm wondering, who is this guy she's looking for? And then she finally sees through the darkness and she starts coming right at me. And my heart just starts beating. <laughs> my daughter wants to be seen with me. She wants to be seen with me. And she gets a few feet from me and she puts her hand out. And my first thought is, oh, she only wants money, you know. <laughs> but not this time. This time she says, Daddy, will you skate with me? And I couldn't believe it as I reached out and I took her hand. And we went out on the floor. And I mean, I am just, just crying. It's all I can do to stop from just wailing as tears, your tears just flowing down my cheeks. Just 30 minutes earlier, she didn't even want to be seen in my presence. And now, as soon as she said, Daddy, would you skate with me? I remembered her sins no more. And as we're skating around that floor, all I could think about was the day she was born. The first time I held her in my arms and I I was a pretty much a newborn Christian, and I held her up to God, and I just said, thank you, God. And that day, my little girl had become my happy thought. And 14 years of hurt and pain and rejection had occurred. But on that skate rink floor, I realized, in spite of all the rebellion and the hurt that had passed back and forth between us, I knew one thing had never changed. She was still my happy thought that all it took was just one moment of wanting to be in my presence. And I remembered no more the 14 years of sin. I remembered no more the rejection of 30 minutes earlier. And all my thoughts became good toward her, Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, I know all the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts for good and not for evil. And see, Peter Pan's children were captain, were held captive by Captain Hook. And Peter Pan couldn't rescue his children until he remembered his happy thought. And so Tinkerbell took him into his childhood home, invaded the childhood land, helped him to get in touch with a few memories to where Memories he had buried because he had gotten so captivated by the cares of life and the cares of the world. And then he suddenly remembered being a little orphan boy. And Peter Pan remembered. His happy thought was, one day I want to grow up and I want to be a daddy. And every time little boy Peter Pan thought about being a daddy who lived to love his daughter, to love his son, Peter Pan would begin to fly. And he flew down and he rescued his children from the clutches of Captain Hook. And see, you are Father God's happy thought. All his thoughts towards you are good, not of evil. 
And it is an impossibility for him to think a negative thought about you because 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love thinketh no evil. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He can't think a dark, negative, accusing, judgmental thought towards you because the Father judges no one. He's not ashamed to be called your God. And you're his happy thought. And when you believe you're his happy thought, you start feeling like it. And when you start feeling like you're fully loved and accepted in the Father and he loves you the way you are, not the way others said you should be, you start believing that, then guess what? Your childlikeness is restored. You get in touch with the childhood land, the things that robbed you of intimacy and love in your youth that we went through last night. And you're able to begin to believe. And when you believe your father's happy thought, then you can fly down and you rescue your children from the clutches of Captain Hook. But most of our children are in the bondage to the world system. They're in the bondage to the, the pharaohs of this world, the Captain Hooks of this world, and we wonder why we can't rescue them. You've got to be able to fly with childlike innocence being restored, knowing Father loves you the way you are, not the way you're supposed to be. And see, people tell me, and this message I get more letters from than any other message, not good ones. I mean the ones that are on people's list. And one of the things they say is, you're giving people a license to sin by making God so forgiving and loving and kind. My first response back is, I didn't realize people needed a license to sin. Because if you don't feel loved, you will look for love in all the wrong places. Others say, well, you're making him too commonplace, and you're taking the awe and fear and reverence of God away from people. Now, let me pose you this question. Which God would you have more honor and respect for? <laughs> this God? Or this one? Which God does your children want you to be most like? This one or this one? Which father would you love to spend all eternity in his home? This one or this one? Hmm? Which father is more likely to make you loving? Which father is more likely to make you angry? Which father's more likely to free you perfect love, casting out all fear? Which father's more likely to increase the fear of failure and rejection in your life? I knew the other God. For 15 years, I preached the other God. And my children didn't want the God I had. And so they went looking for a new God that almost destroyed them. And then I found my happy thought. Father loves me the way I am, not the way I should be. And when that became my happy thought, my children became my happy thought, not my ministry. Because the only thing that brought a smile to my face for 15 years was my ministry. And now I don't need a ministry. It's my children, my wife, that bring the smile to my face. Which God do you want to be most like? Which God does your spouse want you to represent? Which God would sinners most likely be attracted to. Bad people wanted to be with Jesus. Good people wanted to kill him. Do you need a new God tonight? If you've had a false image of God and you realize you've seen a new image through the example and life of Jesus Christ and you want to pray a simple corporate prayer of renouncing the old image 
and embracing the new image, I just want to invite you to stand right now. I invite you to stand right where you're at. If you've struggled, even as Jeremy prayed last night, and Jeremy can play if he's, if he's here. If not, Godfrey can put in one of the instrumental tapes. And pray with me, please. Pray out loud. There's something much more powerful about a vocal prayer. And just say, Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I need a new image of who you are. I've allowed myself to be defiled. My image of you be defiled. I've seen you through the, the, the lens of my fa earthly father's house. And that certainly wasn't a perfect representation of your love. I've seen you through the lens of what religion has presented to me. And I ask you to forgive me, Father God, that I've not judged you rightly, that I've seen you as an angry God in some areas of your nature and character. And that wasn't fair to you. And I didn't realize how much that grieved your heart. You weren't mad at me, but you so longed for intimacy. You longed for me to run to you in my time of need, crawl up in your arms, and receive the Father's embrace. But I couldn't trust you because I had a false image of who you are. And I ask you to forgive me for my unbelief, my lack of trust. And I choose to forgive my parental authority for misrepresenting a father's love. I place the cross between myself and them. Let the cross filter out every misrepresentation of love. And now may only love and grace flow from you, Father. And I bring the religious institutions I've been a part of in the past. Churches, pastors and teachers, things I've seen on TV, teaching I've listened to, all of those things that made me feel that I had to perform enough. I had to be good enough to earn love and acceptance. I choose to forgive each of them. They brought the revelation that they had, but you're taking me deeper. So I pray for fresh revelation for them. Revelation for, their, for, for them for your, of your loving nature and character. And I let go of any judgment or condemnation towards them. I lay any blame at the foot of the cross for the struggles and trials I've had or persecution that I've been through for those who claim to be Christians but who didn't know the Father. I choose to forgive and release them. Now I renounce the ungodly belief that you're an angry God that I have to appease with my performance. I renounce the lie that I could never be good enough to receive your love and acceptance. And I embrace the truth that says you love me the way you, I am not the way I should be. 
I renounce the shame of feeling like I could never match up. Accuser of the brethren, you don't have a right to me anymore. The Father does not judge me. And even though I don't fully keep Jesus' words, He does not judge me. Because in Christ, I am forgiven of my sin. And that's a greater motivator. Unconditional love, a greater motivator for true purity than is fear and intimidation. So I release the guilt, the self-condemnation, the feeling like I'm never good enough to draw close to the Father. But Father, build a new image in me that when I see Jesus, I see you. Every word he spoke are words you're speaking to me as Father. Every act of compassion and mercy are a Father's act of compassion and mercy to me. Your servant, Father, you're good. You're tender. Said, Let that tenderness come right now. There's an anointing that just settled of His goodness. His goodness is resting upon us right now. He does not judge you. And he's not ashamed to be called your father. Oh, just receive his love. Receive his love. Say, Father, I choose for you to be my Abba, my Daddy God. Because I can trust you. But you'll never condemn me. You won't put a finger in my face and give me a lecture. But you'll run to me as she ran to the prodigal so I can experience your embrace. I choose to be your child. And Daddy, I come home to you. Now, I don't know how you're going to do this, but solidify a new image of who you are, the exact representation that when I've seen Jesus, I've seen you. Gentle, humble, reaching out to me with your loving arms. Now in just a moment, we're going to put in a, a CD of a narration by Graham Cook on the goodness of God. And some of you may want to find a safe place and let this narration penetrate you and take you deeper. When I say a safe place, whether kneeling at your seat, whether going to the side over there, I want to save the front for a specific group of people. But if God leads you to find a safe place where this narration, the specific group of people I want to come to the front, as most people who were orphaned as a small child or abandoned by their dads, have a great difficulty receiving anything from the Father. They've been felt mad at God all these years. And after this message of seeing what a loving, serving Father He is, if you were orphaned in your youth or abandoned by a father in your youth, I, I want you to come to the front and stand along the line here around the sides. And I'm going to ask the ministry team to come. If you are orphaned and you want to receive prayer and ministry, we're going to ask the ministry team to stand in as a father, to stand in as a mother, and pray for those who were orphaned. Ask them to forgive you for dying, for leaving you or abandoning you. If you were orphaned or completely abandoned by a father in your childhood, 
We really want to minister very deeply to that right behind this message of the intimacy and the love and the tenderness of God. And then we're going to pray a corporate prayer with those that came forward first because we only have a few team members here in the daytime. But we're going to pray this corporate prayer, and I asked each one of these to pray together. The ministry team move around among them and just embrace or comfort them as the Holy Spirit leads you. And just say, Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I ask you to forgive me, God. Because there was times in my life I was angry at you for not protecting my father or my mother. I was mad at you because they left me. because they weren't there for me. And I thought you had it in your power to somehow protect my parent. And I choose to forgive you for not healing my mother and my father, for not saving them. I realized I was blaming the wrong person. It's the enemy that came to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I choose to release you, God. Now bring that parent, the father or that mother, whether they abandoned you or whether they passed away, and I want this to be a first-person prayer. Say, Mom, Dad, it hurts so much for you to leave. I needed you so much in my life. <laughs> when you left, it was, I was so hurt. I was so angry at you. But other f children had a mother, father, but, but you weren't there for me. And I need to forgive you for leaving me. I forgive you for dying. I forgive you for not being there in the most important moments of my life. Forgive you for not being there on my birthdays. Forgive you for not being there at school events when my friend's parent was there. You weren't there for me. And I forgive you. I forgive you for not being there during sporting events, during times when I won awards. I forgive you for not being there. I forgive you for not being there when I was all dressed for the prom. not being there to tell me that I was pretty or that I was handsome. I forgive you for not being there the day I graduated school. I forgive you for not being there the day I was married not being able to celebrate with me. I forgive you for not being there and sharing the secrets of life with me. How to be a man, how to be a young woman. I forgive you for the pain that you brought to mom and dad when you left. 
and all the problems we went through as a family. I forgive you for leaving us. And I forgive you for not being there to see your grandchildren, to play with them, to celebrate the gift of life that God has given me and children. I forgive you for not being there. And somehow, and deep inside, I was angry at you because of this emptiness inside I felt all my life. And I knew the emptiness was because I've been without you most of my life. I forgive you. And now I bring you to the foot of the cross. And I've got to let go of you. I lay down the disappointment of you not being in my life. I lay down the grief. That childhood grief, that's it. What were the emotions that child was feeling the day that mom or dad died or left? Get in the touch with the emotions of that moment. Let them come back to the surface. What was that child feeling? Now, where was Father God that day? Look throughout the room. What was Father doing that day that you felt abandoned? You felt alone? Though the Father and Mother forsake thee, the Lord will receive thee. For he is a father to the fatherless. And I will not leave you as an orphan, but I will come to you. I will make my love known to you. Father and I will make our home in you. Let his love come. Can a mother forget the child of her womb? Yes. Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. For I have inscribed you upon the palm of my hands. And I have reached out to you with an everlasting love and sought to draw you with loving kindness. Now let his love come. If you need to sit on the floor and just rest and let his love come, that's okay. Find a safe place. Find a safe place. It's his love reaching out to you. Now what's Father saying to that little child? I just see a child in the bedroom, sitting on the bed in the corner, just crying, crying. Father God's reaching out. 
reaching out to take his little girl in his arms. Just to receive him coming. Receive his love coming. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. If we can put in Godfrey the Father's love letter, just the CD, the Father's love letter. Yes, Father. I said, get in touch with those emotions of that little boy, that little girl. And he'll not leave you as an orphan, but Father will come to you. Allow him to come. Allow him to come. Allow him to come. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. See the Father running to the prodigal. Abba's home now. Abba's welcome in your home. He's not angry with you. He's not ashamed of you. He's bringing you into his house, expressing the full extent of his love to you. He's a serving father. And his promises in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never desert nor forsake you. My child, I am always with you, and all that I have is yours. If you would like this tape or any other material produced for Shiloh Place Ministries, you may reach us at 843-365-8990, or you may write to us at Shiloh Place Ministries, Post Office Box 5, Conway, South Carolina, 29528. Either way, we'd love to hear from you. For those comfortable with a computer, check out our website for the latest Shiloh Place itinerary and news at www.shilohplace.org or you may email us at info at shilohplace.org.